Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Fight Addicts. Get ready to explore the past, present, and future of MMA with your hosts, Seth Oliver and Ben Korn. Ben, my man, what's going on? Not a whole lot. Same as always. Yeah, man. What'd you think about our man, Chell Sonnen, calling it quits? Which looks like officially this time, because I know he's done it before in the past. Yeah. But. Um, it's time for him to retire. He's like, what, 42? Yeah, 42. Oh, it's time for him to retire. Yeah. Now, you said before we started the podcast that Chell kind of, he overachieved like, yeah. his career more than what you thought. Kind of explain that. Like, What do you mean by that? Specifically. Well, like he hit a ceiling with his stuff in W. Like he should have had a belt when he fought Paulo Filo the second time, but when he got armbarred the first time, he was winning that fight. It was a lot like the um, the Anderson Silva fight. Okay, he was winning it all the way until he got submitted. That's a lot of chael, you know. Yeah, like he. It's hard to, especially at one eighty five. Like, Chael at 185 is huge and really good at wrestling. Right. So, he's going to beat most people there. Yeah. And what I mentioned to you, too, like, before we started was, I feel like he was always just kind of came in second, a lot like yeah. DC was, because I know that DC had that wrestler that beat him, or that he could never beat. And then, same thing with John Jones. I felt that was kind of like Chael with the belt. Yeah. It's like he would get so close every time, but it's just like, he could never grab it. And Yeah. Absolutely. Be a champion. And I hate that his career ended like that, but. But like, like, I, him but like I said, not everything can be some kind of fairy tale. Like right. That's why it is. That's why it's so awesome whenever it happens. Because it's not supposed to happen. Bisbing isn't supposed to be the champion. But he was. Yep. That's what makes know? sport great. Yeah. That's why it's the greatest But at the, the same sport. time, like, it is it? Like, would it be a storybook ending? Like, was the storybook ending that the guy who, like, need Jorge Rivera clearly when he was down and then spit on his corner after the fight got to be a UFC champion. See, that's the th- perspective like, of everything. Like, yeah, man, like, like Bisbing is no saint. Like, the dude who ripped up the Cuban flag that Jorge Masvidal still says, like, next time I see him, we're going to have words because I'm from there. And it's like, oh, yeah. That's crosses super bunch of lines. Right. But everybody's like, Just it's like a storybook thing. The video that we watched before this – um, hey, hey, and, and Klitschko. What was the boxes? Yeah, Klitschko. Klitschko from last week, everybody. Vladimir Klitschko. I'm sorry. I should have known it last week. But uh, yeah, Vladimir Klitschko, Dr. Steel Hammer. I think that, like, if you legitimately matched him up with most dudes in their prime, I think he would win on the points system. You know, like, it'd be interesting to see him fight, like, Tyson, who had never lost and never went to jail. Like, that'd be interesting. Yeah. But, like, I don't know. I just think that he kind of looks like Lennox Lewis whenever Lennox Lewis beat him up. And we saw Lennox Lewis versus Vitaly Klitschko, which was a really, really good fight. And Vitaly probably was going to win, but he got all cut up. Lennox couldn't really hurt him, but he cut him. I got you. And then they stopped it because okay. of the cut. Well, to transition back to MMA, we're going to go ahead and get into our listener questions for this week. Absolutely. You guys actually sent in five questions, so we're very thankful for that. Good gonna, job, everybody. Going to hit all of them, try to go through them kind of fast, because uh, we have a really good topic that we're wanting to talk about today, and something that both Ben and I are very excited about and we're wanting to start more of. But before we get into that, question number one, which comes from at Alan Honor on Instagram, he asked us, is Ben Askren the best grappler in the UFC welterweight history? And ben, I'm going to let you start out with this one. Yeah, and my response is define what grappling is. Is he the best it's wrestler? It's the first thing that came to my mind. Yeah, is he the best wrestler? Uh, if they all put on singlets and had to abide by the rules of wrestling, then yeah. Yeah, well, let's say in the context of a five-round championship fight, you place Ben Askren versus any other welterweight. I think Will that- he be... And we'll just stick with wrestling because I'm pretty sure that's what he meant by that. So, do you think that he will be the best wrestler against anybody that's competed in the welterweight division in UFC history? I sort of feel like Matt Hughes would bully him. 
like that's our boy in, right there. inside of like the context of MMA. Like if we just somehow transmutated Matt Hughes Prime, the guy who armbarred GSP, like when GSP was better than him the first time they fought, but Matt Hughes was like, "Nope, I'm still the best." Ding, gotcha. Don't want to fight you again because mm. I know I was. Oh. <laughs> Except when you watch that episode or that season of Ultimate Fighter, um, the comeback season, Matt Hughes and GSP are on there, and Matt Hughes is constantly like throwing little barbs at him about how he armbarred him. And I'm like, dude, go watch the first like four and a half minutes of that fight. Watch you getting like spin kicked and being like, oh, I'm kind of getting put on me. Yeah. So, I mean, I like. I think that that's the only people who beat Prime Matt Hughes are people that have a lot of really good striking to combine with grappling. And even then... So they kind of mix it up to where it... Yeah. Yeah. That's the problem. Like, Ben Askren, I feel, is the best if you're not allowed to strike. (laughs) If you're not allowed to throw a punch, I think that Ben Askren could win. I don't know that Damian Maya wouldn't, like, choke him or something. If they got to rolling around and it was a submission grappling tournament with no strikes, that'd be weird, and I'd love to see it, you know. Mm-hmm. But I think that um, Askren is not better than Prime Hughes or Prime GSP just because he wouldn't be allowed to. If if we're talking fights, he wouldn't be allowed to grapple. He'd just get he well. I feel like against GSP he would get jabbed up. He would get he'd get jabbed up by GSP. He would get. I feel like Matt Hughes might finish him with that Death Valley driver that Robbie Lawler hit him with. I feel like it might go something crazy like that when he actually grabs a hold of him, because if you give Matt Hughes the ability to pick you up and slam you down, he's gonna do it. Yeah. Like I mean, go watch Carlos, Carlos Newton, Newton. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Go watch Joe Riggs. That's that's kind of how I feel like it would it would sort of weirdly go is like Askren would be like this guy has so much power and and he's moving ahead and he's not there's no striking. I can't strike him cuz I stink at striking. Yeah. Yeah. I think that I mean we've seen some great grapplers throughout the welterweight division. Like yeah. you said, we've seen Hughes, we've seen GSP, and honestly now like even Usman, I would put him in probably top ten, maybe top five from what we've seen, just because if Tyron Woodley's wrestling is that great, and like look what Usman did to him. Yeah. So I think you have all of them up there. And Ben's grappling is definitely excellent and some of the best that we've seen. I would say you couldn't call him the best yet just because he hasn't faced somebody like a prime GSP or prime Usman or prime Matt Hughes. I think that you might get the answer really soon in the fact that, like, you might get Usman versus... uh, Marty from Nebraska. Yeah. 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 Marty from Nebraska versus uh, Askren. And if that happens and Askren wins the wrestling, then I feel like it's pretty fair and pretty clear. Yeah. To be like, yeah. Okay. That happens. That's kind of well, we like my feeling. That. I mean, it's sort of like when people are like, Muhammad Ali is the best boxer of all time. Like, I'm like, Muhammad Ali has the best resume of all time, but I feel like he would have a horrible time with like Lennox Lewis or Vladimir Klitschko because they're, because if he was fighting in the modern day, he, might not even be a heavyweight. Like, he might cut down to fight people that are normal sized. Yeah. So he could be taller than them and box them up because the dudes that he was able to do that to, other than Foreman, um, weren't really as tall as him. So. Yeah. All right. Our next question comes from at David D1226 on Instagram. He says, Does Conor McGregor ever fight for a title in the UFC again? Yes. You think so? Yep. So how do you think it plays out? Because we have Khabib versus Poirier coming up at UFC 242. And then you have Tony Ferguson in that mix. So how does Conor make his comeback in if he is going to fight? They set up... Khabib beats... Khabib beats Poirier. And they set up... 
Khabib and Tony. And then Tony pulls out because of his mental issues. And then the Gorilla King <laughs> is there. Title fight. Gotcha. And then they say, that doesn't make any sense. He hasn't earned that at all. Yeah. And then we just showed some dolly footage and, you know. But he's back at it. Yeah. Yeah. Mine's actually very similar to that. I think that he does fight for a title again. I think that Tony will fight the winner of Khabib Poirier, which Ben and I both sadly agree it'll probably be Khabib. Uh, I think that those two will actually fight. I think they'll fight in early 2020. I think that Connor will have a fight, probably at MSG at UFC 244. And so then whoever the winner of that whole Khabib Tony Poirier mix, I say Connor fights for the lightweight belt uh next next summer, like next July, International Fight Week. Who does he fight though? That's what matters. Khabib rematch. Because I think that Khabib beats Poirier. Yeah, no, and I'm Khabib saying his Tony. fight in between. I think that he fights Cowboy. I think that he if they can get him to co main event, I think that he co main events. At the Madison Square Garden card this year at UFC 244. What's the main event? Well, see, here's the deal, and this is what I have written down. Colby versus Usman isn't signed yet. So it's kind of like a unofficial but like kind of official fight. So I think that that's all playing into Connor because of how big of a role that he plays. So I think if they could get him to co-main event, I think he could co-main event that. Because you don't really know how big Usman and Covington's going to do but if you throw Connor on that card, that's for sure going to get it, like a huge draw. Let I feel me, like Connor's thing is he wants to be main event. Let me just say that I am not going to be surprised if that happens and Connor is the main event. So you would do Usman Covington as your co main? Yeah. I wouldn't. I think that's horrible. I think but that I'm you could build a storyline to that fight. I'm just judging from Brock Lesnar. I'm not saying you can't build storylines or whatever, like that it's not intriguing, that there shouldn't be a main event. It should, but it cannot headline over a title fight. A title, if there's a title fight on the card, it goes on last. The right. belt is more important than, than any, any story individual. Line. Okay? Like, and if it's not... That's a huge slap in the face to everybody that is uh, that ho- that holds the belt. Yeah, like, I mean that's that holds the that belt. We're an entertainment business. Yes, over a sport. Yes, exactly, so. and they are. So, yeah, he'll get another title shot. Yeah, okay. it has been since Brock Lesnar, man. And then CM Punk solidified that. <laughs> yeah, him fighting on the main card, fighting on the main card, and then having two fights. Yeah, the second fight really. I mean, What's if going the first on? one didn't already, the second one was like literally like hanging it in your face that yeah. we're an entertainment company. Yeah. All right. Our second, our third question is from at the MMA Pursuit on Instagram, which also deals with Connor. He just says, "Does Connor fight by the end of this year?" So we both agree that Connor's going to be fighting for a title, but will Connor fight in 2019? And so I've already said my answer. I think that he fights that Madison Square Garden card. I think that if they get Khabib, uh, my, yeah, if they get Khabib and um, Tony scheduled by the end of the year, he fights this year as the fill-in, as the main event. Yeah, calling it now. He might. I mean, here, hey, here's something else that I'm going to look back and be like, oh, why didn't I say that? He might fill in for Poirier. Yeah, I think that he fills in for Poirier before Tony does. Yeah. Like, they're going to call Connor first before they, before they call Tony, and that's not fair. And I've even said before, I'm not huge on Tony Ferguson. Like, he's a great fighter and everything, but I've never, like, he's a terrible just kind of, like, connected with him. Watch that season of Ultimate Fighter that he wins. Like, you don't have to say, oh, I get a weird vibe off of him. Yeah, man, watch him drunkenly tell people, like, like telling fighters that are beneath him. Like, he's going to style on everyone there. And he kind of knows it from the beginning. You can kind of tell whenever you're better than everybody at something. Yeah. You know? And, like, he sees this fact, but then it's back in the seasons where everybody drank just heavily all the time. And so he gets loaded and, like, starts getting in people's faces and telling them, like, 
yeah, man, you're a horrible father. <laughs> you don't even get to see your, like, you'll never know your children and stuff. And it's just like, why would you say that to somebody? Because, like, I have a theory about alcohol that it reveals your, like, strips you down to if you're a horrible person, then you're a horrible drunk. Like, you can maybe act right in public, but if you're, like, genuinely hateful and don't like your life and stuff, when you get loaded, uh, like, I work in the service industry, so you see people all the time, and they're happy people, they're sad people, they're angry people, and it just kind of brings out whatever that inner emotion is. And, like, it, not necessarily the inner emotion, but, like, how you address people, your inhibitions are lowered. You don't say, is this socially acceptable to say this? It's like your morals are affected by it. It's not necessarily or, that your morals are affected. Okay. It's that they're, it's that they're amp- your morals are amplified in a way. I got you. Like, if you don't have a problem with anything, then you're going to just act like a crazy person. So it's kind of like... If you think of yourself only, then you're going to just kind of do bad things to people. Mm-hmm. And so... When Tony gets drunk, he goes around and just starts, like, saying bad things <laughs> to people's faces To start, that should start a fit. Like, if I was there and another man said those things to me, I would have to attack him physically. Like, there's just nothing that you so can do. So, totally he crosses, crosses the line. every line that you could possibly cross. It's not like the, the, the Klitschko thing, you know? But, like... There are words that you can't say to me without it having to be like a fight. Yeah. You know? I understand what you're saying. Yeah. And Tony did that to people on the show. So he's a, yeah, he's a bad guy. He's, well, look. Yeah. This perfectly falls into our next question, which comes from at Evil Aerial MMA on Instagram. Nice. <laughs> yeah, I knew you'd like that name. He says, if Tony doesn't get the next title shot, what should he do slash what's its next, what is his next fight? I think Tony's best bet is to hold out until he gets a title shot. If not, I think that he needs to try to get that payday from Connor. Um, but he's also crazy enough to rematch Cowboy. He probably fights Cowboy again, and he probably beats Cowboy again, and we're probably in the exact same spot with him. So oh, just like the ultimate logjam kind of with that horror division. show, yeah. So bad, you know? Yeah. Like, because it's not a situation of it's cleared out. You know, like Mm -hmm. 155 is the deepest. I feel like 155 is like the average height of a man is five foot nine, like in the world. So like if a five foot nine guy gets in really good shape, he generally runs about 155 pounds. If uh, And like if he's swole, he's going to try and drop down. He's going to be big for 155. Mm -hmm. Like how tall is Khabib? Khabib's 5'10". Yeah. So he's an inch taller than average. And he shouldn't be fighting at 155. Yeah, he should be fighting at 70. Yeah. Yeah. And so Usman, who fights at 70, should be at 185. You know, right. And so on and so forth, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and that shows you the real tough guys, which is what we get into in our next topic, as far as people can... Bill Wallace not knowing what he's talking about. But uh, to answer the question, Tony will probably fight Cowboy again. He'll probably win. He probably beats... I think, really, if I'm crystal balling it, he loses to Khabib when Khabib loses the belt. Wow. Yeah. That's a, that's a bold he call. He fights Khabib, but it's not for the belt, and Khabib mauls him. And Khabib and is like, I want my belt back. Yeah. So mm-hmm. who does Khabib lose his belt to? Like, how does Khabib end up without the belt since you're putting it in that situation? Because I know we've talked about you said that you think that he beats Poirier. I mean, we just mentioned that. Yeah. So, is the yeah. Gorilla King going to give him the comeback? I mean, I don't know. I think that there's going to be a lot of weird tie-ups with Tony forever, the way that it has been already. Yeah, which is and, unfortunate for his career. I, I hate that it is like that for him. Yeah. Like, no matter how bad of a person he is when he's drunk, like – I want to see. Earned his I want to see the shot. highest Everybody's level. right about that. I want to see the highest level cage fighting that is possible, and it's like Mayhem Miller said on that like documentary, like they're interviewing him and he's like smoking a giant bong while this like <laughs> CNN guy is talking to him, and um, 
they're like, so you have like a lot of like problems with the law and you've had like multiple arrests and like charges and stuff. And he's like, has this ever come up like in any of the promotions that you've worked for? And he, and Mayhem just looks at him and he's like, it's cage fighting, bro. Like they're going to lock you in a cage and you're going to try and make the other person stop trying to fight you by any means necessary. It's ultra violence. Like, no, they don't check your references. <laughs> they let you put gloves on and hurt somebody. And usually somebody's got a screw loose that's really good at it. Back in the day. Yeah. Not so much as, as it gets more ultra athlete. It gets more so regulated. Much. Yeah. yeah. All right. Final question from the listeners. We have from at Fight Venom on Instagram. He says, what's next for Lawler? Oh, good question. That is a good question. My answer is Wonder Boy because they're both coming off losses and that's like a great matchup to make. And I wasn't for sure if they'd ever fought before and I looked it up and they haven't. Yeah. So that would be my pick. Because at first it was Ponzinibbio, but then I went with the whole like I want to see him fight Ponzinibbio more. I want to see him fight. I mean, I would like, rather him fight yeah, Ponzinibbio, but I think him fight realistically. Realistically, yeah. And that's also a fun fight. So I think Lawler gets him. Wonder Boy or Ponzinibbio or both? Wonder Boy. Ponzinibbio roll the dice. Okay, I think I think that I think that Lawler has a better chance of beating Wonder I I know that the odds are not going to be this. Lawler has a better chance of beating Wonder Boy either by being in the middle of the cage and hit the him circling him so it looks like Lawler's advancing. The way that Tyron Woodley beat Wonder Boy. Okay. And it's horrible. <laughs> because yeah. they never, I mean, like, Wonder Boy's good enough to not get hit. Wonder Boy, Machida, those guys. The karate guys. Venom Page. They're Your good favorite. enough. Yeah, but I'm, I'm giving him his due. Like, he yeah, knows how to are. move to where he doesn't get hit. And he can hit you if you step wrong. That's why it looks like such garbage whenever they fight people who know how to step right. It's like, oh, can't, oh. Nope. Well, nope. Hey, nope. For five minutes. Yeah. You know, that's mm -hmm. it. So I think that um, Lawler would beat, Lawler's probably going to fight Wonder Boy. Lawler's going to beat him as an underdog. And if he fought Ponzinibbio, it would be epic. Someone goes that's to That's definitely headline of fight night. Someone that needs goes to be to five sleep. rounds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It doesn't need five rounds. It does doesn't not need, it, need five rounds. You never know, though. Yeah, that, I mean, I agree with you, but like, just in case, let's make this for the sake of, of their night. children. It doesn't need five <laughs> rounds. Like I mean, that's, that's like most fights, though. But <laughs> I mean, just in general, some of them no, because there are fights where it's like somebody gets wrestled. Most of the time, when I'm like, oh, why? It's because there was a fighter who got wrestled, but by the end of it, he's getting the other guy's getting tired. And failing at taking him to the floor. <clears throat> and it's like, if he had another 10 minutes, wrestlers gassed. And it would be time to, every round starts standing. Boss Rutten in the old school, where it goes in that final, like, double overtime. And they've been fighting for, like, 28 minutes or something. And he's like, I'm going to go knock him out now. With a straight whatever, palm strike thing. And mm -hmm. just blasts him. Like, kills him. And everyone's like, what? It's wild. Mm hmm Yeah. All right. Let's go ahead and transition to our main topic for tonight. We're going to be talking about UFC 1. So, to give a little bit of background on UFC 1 and kind of the history of it, or just the statistics of it. UFC 1 was held on November the 12th, 1993. It was held at the McNichols Sports Arena in Denver, Colorado. The attendance for that night was 7,800. And the buy rate was 86,000, which that really surprised me that that many people bought it, especially when you're looking at 2019 and like 100,000 people bought Holly versus Poirier too. I know it's with the whole ESPN Plus thing, but that kind of caught my eye that the buy rate was that. There's no way to pirate it. Really. I mean, like some people did, absolutely. Some people Probably. had like a cable box that they cheated with in the 90s. Mm -hmm. and like a lot of people had those. Like black box that you could get a cable man to come and just like flip a switch in the mid 90s and you could just get all the pay-per-view 
for free. You just had to know a guy who was willing to like break the law. And you could get in trouble if you got caught. According, But it's sort of like, it's very similar to when you download a movie off the internet. Like, there are laws that say, like, every time you pirate something, like, when you rip something to your hard drive, like, you could pay $500,000 and go to jail for, like, three years. Yeah. And it's like, well, I don't want to do that, <laughs> you know? But yeah. nonetheless, um, yeah, the buy rate is so high because it was a different time. It was more violent in the 90s. Like That's, That was definitely evident from watching it. Yeah. Look behind them. Look at, like, the women that are dressed. I mean, they weren't, like, nice-dressed women. It wasn't, like, nice. But, like, there are women in the crowd, and, like, they want to see someone die. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, UFC 1 was co-created by Horian Gracie and Art Davey. And so Ben was kind enough to bring his Art Davey book along with Big John, Big John McCarthy's book. So if you're watching this on YouTube, you see the two books right there. So ben, do you want to talk a little bit about yes. Art Davey? Because I know that okay, so I've you've read, read Art book. Davey's book, and it's very, very, very good. Um, originally, my plan was to like have each section that talked about a fighter, like to read it, but it's written so well and written so like flowingly that each fighter has like a good story that's like six, seven pages long, and um, we don't get paid to do this. <laughs> And I have, like, a family, and I don't want to be here for four hours as I basically read someone's book aloud. <laughs> but um, I do want to give you the ability to do yourself a favor and buy yourself a copy of this if you don't already have it um, and read it. Because it's, if you are interested in UFC 1, it's basically the person who's I, who created UFC 1. It was their idea, their brainchild, along with Horian. And he was able to write this book about the entire experience. And it's really good. Yeah. yeah. And we'll link that product in the description on YouTube. And if you're listening to this, like on an audio only platform, I'll put it in the podcast show notes that you can find on our website. So just have your listening. There's a way to find it if you guys want to purchase that. Yeah. It's, it's a really good book. And then I also have John McCarthy's book, Let's Get It On. Um, it's really good. It has less about, it has more about UFC 2 through whatever, the ones that he did. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, it gets into the story of why he did it, like why he became it. That sumo fight that starts it is why he became the ref, because of what the ref does in that fight. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's go ahead and get into that fight. So the first okay. fight. Yeah. First fight was Gerard Gerdeau versus Tila Tuli. Yes. So, whenever UFC 1 was created, it was created as a tournament style. And a lot of you already know this. But for well, those of you that hold don't, on. All right. Hold on. Let's start with who's telling us about this event. Yeah. Who our the commentary the team is. Because let me tell you something. Joe Rogan, they are not. <laughs> that was very evident. First off, there's one point in it where there are... There are Five people with microphones sitting there talking at the same time on top of each other, mm -hmm. trying to like say because they don't have any, they have no format, they have nothing, and no one ever gave them a lesson of to not speak when someone else is speaking. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, yeah, and the, well, the main three commentators were Bill Wallace. Jim Brown and Kathy Long. Yes. And I, I wrote down, Wallace opened up the show calling it the Ultimate Fighting Challenge. Yes. That was his very first statement, like, of the company's name was the Ultimate Fighting Challenge. Yeah, so he from the get-go right there. Yeah. After McNichols. He, like, is McNichols... <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Sporting Arena. Yeah. Like, and, like, it's hilarious in the, in, in his, in the book, it talks about him watching it. And he's like, what was that? <laughs> what are you doing? Like, and, uh, yeah, so um, Bill Wallace was like a karate guy. So Sugarfoot, Superfoot, Bill Superfoot Wallace. Yeah, not sure. Superfoot Wallace. And um, we're talking like point fighting. Okay. It's not real fighting. Nothing like UFC. Um, yeah. 
And he thinks that he's going to be Wonder Boy Thompson, like if he were in there. Like, he really does. He thinks that that's exactly what would work. But he's never been shot on a day in his life. Like, no one's ever tried to take his legs out from under him. Yeah. So, like, he says things that are completely ridiculous. He repeatedly says that weight doesn't matter. And, like, yes, it does. <laughs> yeah. But it's just terrible. Even though the smallest guy does win. Yeah, but... This, but, this, yeah, you have to understand the context of it. Because, I mean, I totally agree with you. Weight definitely does matter. I was actually talking to somebody at UPS, which is where I work, about that. About how weight does matter in the fight. Because somebody asked me if that's the, like, most fair way to match people up. Like, why not do it by height? Or why not do it by reach? Like, why weight? Because weight is the best gauge of how strong someone is going to be. Because that's if, exactly what I said. Because imagine... Yeah. A 5'10 could be but 200, and me, who weighs 160 pounds. Yeah. That's, that's not fair at all. That's why weight is definitely the best gauge to go by. Gagey. Best gagey to go by. Best gagey. Yeah. Um, no, like, the reason that weight matters is because it's generally a tale of, like, how strong someone can be. Like, you generally know that a person at 170 pounds, the top end of the strength pool is here. Because that's the ultimate, like, like reach matters, height matters, but it can be overcome with power. Like, you get some gangly guy in there fighting a fire hydrant who knows how to wrestle. Like, you let, like, have me and Welby have a fight. <laughs> You know? Now explain Welby to all the people out there. Welby is my old roommate who is one of the most naturally gifted athletes. He's not the Yoel Romero of Ashton yeah, City. Yeah, not necessarily like even that he's an athlete. Like It's not like he plays a sport. It's not like he ever played a sport. He, I think he was a cheerleader. I think he was a male cheerleader. Seriously? Yeah, he can walk on his hands downstairs. Things like that. Like he can that doesn't do, surprise me. He's like a gymnast almost, but he also knows jujitsu. And uh, his brother got signed to go fight in Japan at one point, but didn't go. And, like, because he because his brother weighs, like, 115 pounds dripping wet. Like, his brother is legitimately tiny. No offense, Kenny, if you see this. Um, you might weigh more than that. That's not, like, because <laughs> seriously, as far as, like, somebody who weighs 115 pounds as a grown man, that could just, like... <laughs> Put me on the like, kill me with his bare hands. Mm -hmm. Even though I'm six foot one and 180 pounds, I've lost a lot of weight. But yeah, <laughs> um, even though I'm six foot one, 180 pounds, he could kill me at 115 because mm -hmm. he knows what he's doing, and that's why Hoist was able to do what he did. So I was just about to say, doing. yeah, yeah. Now, one thing, like whenever the show starts, you see three things that pop up, like three kind of like promoted things: no rules, no scoring. No time limits. And then I also noticed the phrase, no holds barred, is, like, very emphasized. Like, you tell that was what they're going for in this, to, like, draw people into yeah. it. Yeah. 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 Bloodlust. Human cockfighting. You're just You're going to see someone die. Yeah. Just right. bleed, baby. Yeah. And I think that you came pretty close with a couple of things that happened in there. That, like, if someone who was more skilled was doing it, like, uh... When Jardo put down Rozier, we'll get to it. We'll get to it. Yeah, yeah. we're going to do it chronologically. Let's do this chronologically, everybody. All right. Yeah. So, um, first fight. First fight. Uh, we got the sumo against um, Savat. The Nazi. Yeah. <laughs> um, did you see that? Did, every, did anybody else see that? That's in the book. Uh, he's watching the monitor and he's like, okay, so the first fighter came out and. Just Nazi saluted at every side of the ring. I don't know what just happened. Like, why did this just happen? And apparently somebody told him in That's between. That's a way to kick off the show. Yeah, it it wasn't an intentional, like, Sig Heil. <laughs> like, that wasn't <laughs> yeah. what he was trying to do. That's, like, what they do in, like, Savat in, you know, France or wherever it was, mm -hmm. you know? And it didn't have that meaning, but, like, it got taken wrong. And so, like, that's why if you watch the next fight... He goes out and he does this, and he's like, I'm sorry. Yeah. My bad. Yeah. Like, 
I don't really speak the greatest English, and I know I offended a bunch of people. Um, yeah. Yeah. Now, real quick, actually, before we get into the first fight, going yes. back to how it was set up. Yes. This is an eight-man tournament, and the winner receives $50,000. Yes. So there's no weight classes, no rounds, no judges, like we just said. There were two, ru- two rules, though, that night. No biting, no eye gouging. Double check me on that. Is that correct? Because that is what you I couldn't found. bite. You couldn't eye gouge. Because groin shots were legal. No, they said no groin strikes on the first one. The first one, you were not allowed to hit him in the hit him low. You're not. They say it, but they do during it. Because yes. I never saw it stop. Because the very first fight, there's a groin shot in that, isn't there? No. On the on the sumo? Okay, I was thinking there was. Maybe, maybe that's another the sumo. fight. The sumo comes in, and then I like I, I've seen this. I've seen the fights a hundred times. Well, not a hundred times, but like I've seen them at least ten times. Mm-hmm. All the fights, all the way through. But I've also not seen them in like ten years. So, watching it again today, I was like so excited watching all of it again. Where Jim Brown says. Yeah, he stuck his, he pulled them down. Like he put his hand behind the back of his head and shucked him forward to where he winds up. He hits him, he uppercuts him, but he's Mm -hmm. also pushing him down. It's almost a, it's way more of a momentum than a, I'm going to strike you and make you fall down. It's like the thing I was telling you about people running into power is how you knock them out. Mm -hmm. He wasn't even trying to knock him out. He was trying to get him off his feet so that he's lying there and he can be like, kabang. There goes your tooth. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and that, <laughs> that's what you see in the first fight. Yeah. So. But that's my, uh, and I don't know if I've said this on the podcast, but it's something that I say in life all the time. Every time I see someone that weighs over 300 pounds, that isn't like six foot eight, I always think that my go-to move when they're attacking me, uh, like I'm going to be randomly attacked by a lot of like large <laughs> giant wrestler, men. Yeah. yeah, you know, like my plan is like to grab them because they're always big guys. Strong guys are usually all about like, I'm going to overpower you. I'm stronger than you and I'm going to put it on you. I'm going to move forward and press forward like the sumo does in that fight. And Jordo just uppercuts him, shucks him to the side, doesn't let him get his feet tees off Mm. knows how to throw a kick watch his inner foot that's the thing about throwing a kick this foot needs to be like this so that your hip is gonna the this like this foot left foot for our audio listeners that aren't watching yeah yeah (laughs) Yeah. everybody should watch this on youtube this foot needs to turn to the left your left foot should be turned to the left when you're throwing the kick right in front of you because you're going to go through it. You're trying to swing your your hips and your groin are like a slingshot. Throwing your shin is like a baseball bat at what you're trying to hit. Mm-hmm. And he did that, but he didn't hit shin. He hit foot, which broke his foot. Yeah. I got you. So that was the Grado versus Sumo fight. So we have Savat advances first. Yes. Against the Sumo wrestler. Um. Also, the last thing I was going to mention, which, going back to the eye gouging, yeah. it says that um, the penalty for that was just a $1,500 fine. Yeah. So that's what I found written for that. And then, so, since there's no, like, not supposed to be any ref stoppages or anything like that, the match only ends by submission, knockout, or throwing in the towel. Yes. So that's, going back to, like, the bloodlust thing, I mean, that's, yeah. to use the UFC's motto, as real as it gets. Yeah. So, now... Second fight of the night, we have Kevin Rozier, the kickboxer, taking on Zane Frazier, who's a karate guy. Yeah. So, actually, one thing I want to touch on, going back to the old fight, <laughs> Two Lee, the sumo guy, that was 410 pounds, I think yes. it was. He claims that the biggest thing about him is his heart Yeah. in the promo. So, I found that funny, and I thought that was something that, um, let that would me make read, you laugh. Let me read the um, comedic gold that um, I had uh, forgotten. Yeah, go for it. I said, I wrote down, strongest muscle is his heart. 
not wrong being 410 pounds. <laughs> it's yeah. not healthy. Yeah. <laughs> your, your heart is going to be huge, enlarged because of that. Not good. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Everybody just clapped at that. Thank you all. Yeah. All right. So kickboxing, or we, sorry, <laughs> Kevin Rozier, the kickboxer versus Zane Frazier, karate. Yes. So the crowd seemed to be really into this one. That's what I remember. Because it was a good fight. Yeah, and it yeah. lasted longer than 45 seconds. Mm -hmm. so, and it looked like it was a real fight. Yeah, till about three minutes in, and then they both <laughs> kind of gas, and there's a lot Here's of... Here's my question. Have you ever been to Colorado? I have not been to Colorado, but okay. I know all about the altitude okay. and everything. So you know all about it, mm -hmm. but let me give you a little story. Okay. Story time with Ben, everybody. We went to Ogden, Utah on a missions trip when I was a senior in high school. Because we're Muslims to everybody listening out there. Yeah. 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 Um, anyway, <laughs> I was about to say it, yeah. something about Mormonism, but I'm not going to. Right. Um, yeah, so like, we go on this mission trip, and I'm 17 years old. I just got done playing my senior year soccer. I've never smoked a cigarette in my life. I'm singing all the time. I've got good lungs. I'm skinny. And we pulled over the van in Vail, Colorado. This like ski resort place. And we stayed at this really nice like cabin because it was out of ski. It was in the summer. So no one wanted it because it's like, who's in Vail when there's not any snow? Right. It's like us. And there is snow. That's the crazy thing. I'm in shorts. It's July and there's snow because you're up in the mountains. And um, I got out of the van and I just started sprinting. Like it was slightly uphill, but I just started sprinting. And I got like 50 yards and was just like, <sighs> like, and then I got back to the van. Like, I walked back to the van, huffing and puffing, and it was like 10 minutes before I was breathing normally from sprinting for 50 feet. And I could play soccer in Tennessee for 60 minutes or whatever it is, mm -hmm. 45 minutes, right? It's like 15 minute court. No, uh, it's two 40 minute halves. Really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I don't even remember. Yeah. So you're looking at like, yeah, like 80 minutes. Yeah. And you have to run, especially mm -hmm. when you play defense for Pleasant View Christian School. You're always <laughs> running. Um, yeah. And I couldn't. Like, I was completely, like, I would have died. Like, if someone was trying to beat me up, I couldn't have stopped them from it. Yeah. But those dudes were out there throwing bombs. That, uh, with the Rozier fight, Zane Frazier had to broken his hand. There's one clean one down the middle that he, that a six foot six dude lands flush on Rozier. And he just eats it. I think that might have been the one that cut his eye. But like, it was so hard. And, I, and when he didn't go down, I was like, that didn't land perfectly correctly. But it was so hard that he probably shattered all of this. Something gives when you hit someone that hard. Mm -hmm. Either your hand or the thing you're hitting. And the thing that he's hitting was just like, ugh. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now, the fight ends kind of weird. Because you see, you see Rozier, like they kind of go back up against the cage. Yeah. And then see, he throws a shot that it doesn't really like Frazier would fall down to. But then he kind of does in like an odd way. So then you just see Rozier like blast in the back of his head. Yeah. And then he ends it by the stomp. stomps. Yeah. Just sits there. I think he lands maybe like three or five stomps on his head. Yeah. And then you just see the towel thrown in. Yep. And that's the fight. Yep. And that one, that is the longest fight on the card. And I'm pretty sure in Colorado it was 420, four minutes, 20 seconds. So there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Illuminati is real. Uh, third fight Hoist Gracie versus Art Jimerson. There's a lot to this fight. So this style is jiu jitsu versus boxing. And so Art, Jim <laughs> Art Jimerson in his promo. You know, being the boxer fighting the jiu-jitsu guy. Oh, hey, in that, uh, I'm sorry. Got? No, you're good. In that previous fight, I wanted to say uh, that 
Mazzagatti only watches that fight <laughs> in terms yeah. of how he's going to stop something. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. like. Did you write down like a piece of comedy for each fight? Well, no, I just... Because uh, <laughs> I don't know if you go through them at the end and if you did that or not. Yeah, I wrote down no, bu- no groin strikes biting eye gouging. That's where they say it. Okay. Because he loses a clump of his hair. Like Zane Frazier yanks out a giant clump of Rozier's hair and it's on the mat. Those weird dudes with towels run in and clean it out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. Absolutely. So on to Gracie versus Jimerson. Art Jimerson in his promo says you can't hit what you can't see. Coming from the boxers, you kind of tell where his mindset is coming into that. And he only fights with one boxing glove on. So that I feel like that's kind of like one of the key takeaways from UFC one or like things. An iconic moment of the sport. It's just a picture of like him with Hoist Grace and he's fighting with one boxing glove on. Yeah. But like, yes, did, you're right. Did Davey say in the book why he did that? Are there any comments on that? Yeah. And there's a reason that I'm pointing it out because it comes to effect in the fight. So what did he say about okay, it? Okay. So originally. The rule was, okay, so he says in his book, let me, hold up, well, let me just say, he says in his book, he says, I wanted everybody to be able to represent their discipline in whatever they wanted to wear to represent their discipline. So, the only thing he said was, like, you shouldn't be able to kick if you have shoes on. That was a big thing for him. Okay, and Jimerson did wear shoes in this fight. Yeah, did he kick? Uh, no, he never threw a kick. Yeah, so, like, I think that was a lot. Like, there's a lot of stuff that doesn't get said on this broadcast. There's a rules meeting, and there's all this big deal about hand wraps, and there's all this big deal. Like, it almost doesn't happen. And the reason that it does happen is the sumo. Because he stands up. It's all the fighters in a room together, like discussing what the rules of this contest are going to be. And Zane Frazier knows he's going to lose. He's in over his head. He lied about a lot of things. Uh, Which, to remind everybody, he is the karate guy that fought in the second fight. Yeah. And he got finished by the kickboxer. Yeah, he got finished by Rozier. He, um, okay, the movie Bloodsport. Do you know what that is? Know what it is, but I haven't seen okay. it. Okay. Before the next podcast, Seth is going to go watch Bloodsport. <laughs> and All right. We'll yeah. See. He will. So, in the Jean-Claude Van Damme movie, he plays a guy named Frank Duke. Frank Dukes? It's D-U-X. Is how it's spelled. And I think it's like supposed to be French, like do. Okay. But like, it's not spelled like that is in French, mm-hmm. which is kind of a very good tell for what this guy is. He's a huge con man. He's lied about everything in his life. He's like Steven Seagal in a lot of ways, except without any of the actual ability. And he said that he fought in this thing called the Kumite that was like this underground fighting tournament that was that only that he won. And he's like a SEAL guy, but he's not really. He was never in the I mean, maybe he was in the military, but he was never in, like, special forces. Yeah, I get what you're he saying. He was never in the CIA. All that stuff is lies. Well, Zane Frazier went somewhere that he knew Frank Duke was going to be and put up, like, got a roll of quarters in his hand, <laughs> went up to, like, the booth where he's, like, signing stuff and punched him in the face, like, five times and was like, yeah, I knocked out the dude from Bloodsport. That happened? Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. Like, here's and the is thing. That, that's like here's, his ticket into the UFC? Kind of, yeah. In that's a lot insane. of ways. Yeah. 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 There's yeah. a story. <laughs> that, yeah, exactly. That's crazy. Um, we'll get to some good ones as far as, like, people's, like, backstory that shouldn't be there. Um, the one that always jumps to my mind is the guy who fought Dan, Don Fry from Port- – the one that was in Puerto Rico, the guy from Puerto Rico that was in a shirt – Okay, and so like this is going to be like giant fat next guy. episode. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be down the road. Because he's not, yeah. It's impossible to find, his name is like the equivalent of like John Smith. 
two. Just the most basic. Yeah, okay. he's like, it's it's either Ruiz or Rodriguez. Like it's something very common for that part of the world, and then his first name is not distinct either. So it's like you can't find any information about him. It bothers like me. Still. Carlos Rodriguez or yeah, something like that. Yeah. Okay. And Don Fry knocks him out with a jab. <laughs> he just pop pop and he out with his eyes open. Just Dang. dead in the corner. But yeah. anyway, um where were we? <laughs> <laughs> we're on the Hoist Gracie Art Jimerson fight. Yeah. Art saw ahead of time uh the thing that you learn before the fight. Art had seen someone showed him like a tape of like Gracie Challenge stuff. And like them breaking people's arms and just hurting people and stuff mm-hmm. in the garage. Dudes who were like strikers. It's like, I, I didn't sign up for this. Like, yeah. So he was scared and he got owned. But the glove thing, that's yeah. what I was going to tell you. Mm-hmm. Sorry about that, everybody. So they have the rules meeting. Everyone is disagreeing on a lot of different things. Zane Frazier is really causing all the problems because Zane Frazier doesn't want to have to get locked in a cage with anybody that's there. Honestly, he probably got locked in the cage with the dude that he would do the best against. And he still lost. I think that's fair. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'd like to see him fight Gerard because I think Gerard messes him up. Yeah. Uh, Gerard is somebody that I was going to talk about. I, want, I really wanted to see him like post UFC 1. He's there. May, like your UFC. He's in some pride stuff. Okay. With a weird back tattoo. Gotcha. I saw He's him. definitely one that like I, I want to know more about. Yeah. He bites, he, legit. he bites Gracie at the end. I'll tell you about that here in just a second. Okay. So yeah. anyway, um, yeah, he's terrified that he's going to get his arm broken or get choked unconscious or get, like, really hurt. So this he taps, is Jimerson. Like, yeah, Jimerson's yeah, okay. like, if I don't hit him, like, I'm going to have to keep him away with my jab. But he doesn't even know how to wrestle, so it's yeah, done. Yeah, well, that's, done. that's what I was going to say. So during the fight, I mean, they both – obviously, you start up standing – there's not really any strikes thrown for maybe the first 20, 30 seconds. And then about maybe 45 seconds a minute in, Gracie shoots and immediately advances to full mount. Yeah. Gets his locks in. Great finds those legs, scares him to death. Right. Can't move his legs. And so Jimerson taps to mount. Yeah. Yeah. Position. Yeah, tap to position. How like, many is that? I don't know what it is written down as. I told my wife when I was talking about this today, I was like, I know that Joe Son, the convicted rapist and uh, probably murderer, I think he killed his cellmate in prison, um, which is like his one victory. Um, <laughs> wow. he, um, uh, he's the guy that gets, um, he, he, he's the dude that gets the groin strikes done to him, the little protege of chemo. Okay. You know, all super Jesus-y, but then gets convicted of gang rape. Whenever DNA comes out, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. So he also fought in like a like a thong, in like Pride, I think it was. Seriously, yes, seriously. I haven't seen he this. Comes I'm gonna check that out. He's all like pudgy, no all pudgy, five foot two of him comes out in like a thong with a cane and does a little dance, and then whoever he's fighting. Oh, he's I have running seen away this. from I have him, seen this. and they keep like all the Japanese dudes like keep like trying to push him back in the ring, but he doesn't have anything. Over his butt, so they just have to like fondle him, like oh no 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 yeah yeah, and um, that that goes down as submission terror on sure dog submission terror submission terror okay well the <laughs> the Jimerson fires record as submission mount on yeah, Wikipedia that's fair I didn't check sure that's what he tapped to yeah he tapped because he got mounted and he taps that's and fair. then about ten fifteen seconds later the ref kind of waves it off yeah. 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 There's a lot of that. I was about to say, there's a ton of that on this. So, so far we've had Gerdo advances, so Savat beats Sumo, and then Kevin Rogier and Zane Frazier, kickboxing beat karate, and we get into Hoist Gracie where Jiu-Jitsu beat boxing. Yeah. So and then, I can, let me just say about that fight, I can almost forgive the ref because he knew what was going on on the ground. He's a Brazilian guy. Mm-hmm. And he'd, he had refed like that kind of stuff in Brazil before. So when he sees someone get mounted and then slap the mat, he's like, there's nothing. He's not hurting him. Right. I can see that from the position that I'm in. That must not be what that means. Then he, like, started yelling, you know. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Real quick, yeah. could you bring your mic just a little bit closer to your mouth? Absolutely. All right. Thank you so much. So getting into yeah. the next fight, uh, which these are all like your, um, like the first fights before anybody advances, like the original bracket. I can't think of the word for that. But we have preliminaries. Yeah, your preliminaries. Ken Shamrock is on the card, uh, representing shoot fighting, and he fights Pat Smith, who is Taekwondo. So I have written down. I think that this fight looks the most like what you would see in the UFC today. Oh, these are the the quarterfinals, not the preliminaries. Okay. DeLuca is in the preliminaries. Who is? Jason DeLuca. Okay. Let me tell you the ballad of Jason DeLuca. Well, that's not on the broadcast, though, is it? Cause it's not on the broadcast, but it's on the card. Okay. That's like, like, it it's happened. not on Fight Pass. It's not on Fight Pass, but there's a lot of stuff that the UFC doesn't want you to remember. Don't ever believe like the the whatever the narrative is, go and have found out from either being there or good research of your own. Don't ever believe like, oh, well, UFC is going to tell me the complete and whole truth about the past of the UFC. If I watch these 100 fights, <laughs> I'll, I'll know everything that there is to know because Frank, th- there's a brother to Ken Shamrock? Yeah, and Look he was the baddest it. man in the Look world into it. for years. Yeah. Yeah, that Jason, um, yeah, DeLuca or DeLucia, uh, DeLuca. he defeats Trent Jenkins. That's Liz's yeah. alternate bout, yeah. I want to say that that's the ponytail fight. DeLuca has, a, DeLuca has a ponytail, and he fights someone with a ponytail, and they make a comment that they both made a gentleman's agreement not to pull the other one's ponytail. DeLuca took the Gracie challenge and, and got owned in a garage as like a karate fighter, mm-hmm. and then he just kept going back and learning. He, he wanted to learn jujitsu enough to prove that his style and his like dojo was superior to the Gracies. Gotcha. And so he just went and got owned forever into eternity because he's some white dude. Uh-huh. But he showed up in rings in Japan, and he fought Boss Rutten. And Boss Rutten hit, it made his uh, liver, or he made his liver, his pancreas explode. I think it was his pancreas because you can't crazy. live without a liver, right? Yeah. You die. Pancreas mm-hmm. you cannot have. Probably more so than a liver. I would. I'd yeah, bet. but he almost yeah. killed him with a body blow, mm-hmm. with a palm strike body blow. Like, or wait a minute, no, I think you can throw closed fist to the body. You're not allowed to punch someone in the face though, in rings. And then, in 2010, 2009, Jason DeLuca started put it, posting like delusional things on Sure Dog about how he put like a curse on Boss Rutten. And it was the actual, everyone was like, that's not really Jason DeLuca. There's no way. This is crazy. And then the actual Boss Rutten showed up on Sure Dog and was like, I don't know what's going on, but <laughs> yeah, if you want to, if you want, like, he's like, what are you talking about? Like, cause he beat him twice. Mm-hmm. Like Boss beat him twice. And he's like, are you talking about the first fight or the one where I made, like, almost killed you? I almost ended your life. Yeah. Yeah. You, know. you got so like that boss, guy. Man. He's, yeah. he's one of my favorites. Yeah. From the old days. So yeah, Ken Shamrock, Pat Smith. Like I said, I feel like this fight looks the most like what you would see in the UFC today. Like they both looked what starts out standing, and then when it gets to yeah. the ground, you actually see like a full guard taking place. And it's not like a straight advance to mount, like you saw in the Gracie versus Pat Smith fight. And then you just see Ken uh like less than two minutes in, he just locks up the hill hook. I wish that we could do like a round robin thing. Because my question is, like, if the bracket got sh- sh- shaken up, like, obviously, Ken and Hoist go to the end of the thing. Like, Ken and Hoist are going to win. One of them is going to win every time. Correct? I think that Gerdo might pose a threat to Ken. I would like to see them fight it out. You don't think he does exactly what he did to Pat Smith? Pat Smith versus Gerdo would be good. Pat Smith hangs around in, like, fighting. Okay, I, I, I would rank it like this. Like, you have one is Hoist. Two is Ken, three is Grado, four is Pat Smith. That's fair. Okay, I'll give I'll give you that. Yeah, it's it's Ken and Hoyce. But I I feel like Grado is like your dark horse. That's what I took away from it. I think that if a striker gets through, though, it's going to be like if they have like a round robin where 
no grappling occurs, I'm I'm pretty sure that Pat Smith would win, that he'd beat Gerdo. We need to see it. Like we, we <laughs> it'd be cool to have seen it somehow. Yeah. those two fight. It would be good. There are a couple coming up whenever we do some later, like early ones. Later, early ones that are bangers, man. Mm. Like it's two dudes that are like, because when they're still doing the tournament, they were doing the random draw stuff, and you got a couple that it was like, yes, it is not wrestler, it is not it is not style versus style, really. It's like I'm a Muay Thai guy and I'm a karate guy. It's like good. Yeah, let's see it. That's what we need to see. Yeah. Yeah. So you have any comments on the Shamrock Smith fight? Any comedic gold that you have written down for this uh, one? That you can find in the notebook. I said that uh, Pat Smith referred to him as himself as most strongest power, the, the most strongest powerfulest, and I was like, strongest is the correct thing, but you put most in front of it, and then powerful, <laughs> yeah. most powerful is how you say that, but it was powerfulest. <laughs> Yeah. And I was like, man, that just like blew my mind in that moment. I was like, wait, no. And then I was trying to correct it. And I was like, no, that, okay. So I just wrote it down. <laughs> but, um, and he the feels no pain. Powerfulest. He feels no pain. That's the thing that he said. Mm-hmm. And then he felt pain. Yeah. Yeah. To happen to that hill hook. Well, he could have broken his ankle or he could have just gotten a really bad Charlie horse there. <laughs> What's that? That's what Wallace, Wallace said. said it. Yeah. I'm like, he, he might not ever be able to know when. He might know when it's going to rain for the rest of his life because mm-hmm. of this match with Ken Shamrock. Or he could have yeah. just gotten a Charlie horse. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> yeah. That, that's seriously such a huge like narrative in it. Or not necessarily narrative. That was a bad word to use. But just a huge takeaway from it is <laughs> Ben Wa- Is it Ben Wallace? Bill Wallace. Bill sorry. Wallace. Ben yeah. Wallace is an uh, NBA player. Bill Wallace. Ben commentary. Wallace has like a... 80% field goal percentage because he just dunks. That's all it is. He never shoots. He just jams it. Beautiful. Yeah. Back in the Detroit days, baby. Yeah. Monster. All right. So then after all these fights, we get uh, your semifinals. Which yeah. is uh, Rozier versus Gudo. Or yeah. Gudo. So that's kickboxing versus Savat. Uh, Gudo looks very good on the feet in the fight. And um, <laughs> after the fight ends, I love the post-fight interview with, like, Rozier and his little sidekick that just keeps, like, trying to butt in. That had me, my brother, and my dad, like, we were dying laughing at that. I need to find out who that is because he's not the only time you see him. We need to get him on the show. You don't I don't think so? know that we do. <laughs> you don't think that'd be hilarious? I don't know. I... I... Maybe, but I think that I'd make him mad because there's a point that, okay, like I, you guys won't remember this, but I'm going to bring it up now and I'll bring it up again because it's beautiful. Okay. He is the manager for Harold Howard. Bring it on, come on. Mm-hmm. That crazy guy. Master Jiu Jitsu standing up. Yeah, that yeah. guy. Crazy, crazy dude from Canada. That I, Somehow I feel like I'm saying that wrong as far as like Master Jiu Jitsu standing up. I and I've know. been quoting that from yeah, you. Yeah, I know, I, I know, right. but like you keep saying it, and I'm like, I think I told him that not correct. I'll have to look it up after this. But um, the thing about him is he shows up as Harold Howard's manager, and it's Harold Howard advances in the tournament because Chemo makes it to where Hoist can't fight. And Chemo this is UFC almost kills what? him. Do you know? Three. Okay. I think it's the one where he's in the tournament and he. I'm not good with numbers. I can tell you what happened. Like, it should be like, what happened whenever they fought? I'll okay, tell so you that. just early UFC. Early, it's not yeah, one. It's a yeah. tournament. Yeah, and it's not one. I think it's three. Um, but Harold Howard advances because because uh, Gracie comes out, but they throw the towel before it starts. So Howard is like, ah. <laughs> and, like, the manager runs in, and he's got on a red blazer. With like it's like a it's like a tuxedo suit coat, with like black lapels, like something Buffer would wear. Now, mm-hmm. no shirt at all. That hat, I think he had that hat, or he was he's bald too. Maybe it comes off. And I think he had a cigar, legitimately, and like a press pass. And he's like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, we beat Ois Gracie. <laughs> I'm like, yep. In the only way that that would ever happen, you did, sir. Yeah. Good job. Although, like, 
that's the moment, like the that chemo fight is when you realize that the wheels are going to come off the wagon and size does matter. But yeah. Yeah. So moving so, forward to the wheels staying completely on the wagon and Gracie fighting. Or wait, no, we didn't do. We're at Rogier versus Yeah, Gerdeau. we didn't do Rogier Gerdo. Gerdo kills him. He tries the same strategy. And Gerdo has like a pulse rate of like 60 because he's a bouncer in Holland where everyone's a giant mm-hmm. and knows how to kickbox. Which is Rogier. Yeah. Yeah. So. He. He he worked at a bounce. He's a bouncer at a brothel. Because <laughs> prostitution is legal. I got you. So like, and obviously, like, if you're working as a bouncer in a brothel, you probably have some kind of. And I'm not trying to make any allegations, although I don't think Gerard's going to come to Tennessee anytime <laughs> soon. But like, it's implied in book like that he was probably involved with some form of like organized crime. Yeah. Yeah. Like sex trap, sex stuff, you know, mm-hmm. but like the strong man for it. Yeah. So when you lock him in a cage, it's like, that's what yeah, you get. Okay. Yeah. yeah. You know, I can handle this. It's not as scary as what I, she's like, um, Paulo Tiago or yeah, Paulo Tiago, who's like on the Brazilian SWAT team and goes and raids like drug Lord buildings, like the end of Scarface mm-hmm. with a AK 47. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, and then they lock him in a cage, and he's like, yeah, I think I'm going to knock out Josh Koscher. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Well, the next fight is Hoist versus Ken. Mm-hmm. So that's, you know, your two most recognizable names on the card, which is jiu-jitsu versus shoot fighting. And the one note that I have from that is that uh, Hoist clearly felt a tap. <laughs> so because you have Ken, um, I don't even have the submission right now. I'm going to have to look it up real quick. Okay, it was a sleeve choke. Yep. what it has written down. Yep. So gets him in the sleeve choke. Ken taps five times. Ref's a little late. I think and a shiver. It, I, I, and then. Yeah, I think a shiver went down uh, Pat Milich's spine and Robbie Lawler's spine. Because that the way that he got the sleeve choke is very bulldoggy. Yeah. He hasn't been that side. He's got that side headlock. Yeah, there's spotty but things there was a, tingling. It was, yeah. It's much worse because there's a sleeve involved. Like... That gi, that is so important, and it, I think people should still be allowed to do it. Wear gis whenever yes. they fight? Yes. Why do you think so? Because if it's really a... It's no longer the same premise that it was. Mixed martial arts is not the same premise that it was because it changed from being about, like, what would actually happen if these two people had a fight? It's the problem. Like, So you th- do you think that it got too regulated? Yes. Okay. Because like, so all fighters shouldn't have to wear... Reebok shorts, no. no shirt. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You should be able to wear a gi or a speedo, just like they did right there. And you saw why Hoist wanted to wear a gi. You mm-hmm. know, yeah. yeah. But like, I can show you a fight where dude gets hockeyed. <laughs> like, I can show you a fight in Pride where this Japanese guy is in a gi, and I, I don't. Rem- I, it might have been Vanderlei. If somebody good on their feet who grabs that gi and pulls it over their, like, pulls it over the top of their head and is just uppercutting them to death. And then the dude, like, steps back and whips it off, like, whips off the gi top and the Japanese crowd, like, erupts because it's like Japanese guys can come get down and he gets knocked out (laughs) cleanly because it's like, (laughs) yep, if you wear a gi to a fight, it's probably not the best scenario that you're like, I'm taking this off now. Yeah. It's going to end bad. I'm taking this off because I'm getting it handed to me on my feet. And I think the only problem is this coat. That's your only advantage and you're about to lose it. Yeah. So after that, so Hoist wins by sleeve choke. We get to the like the finale of the tournament, so which is Hoist Gracie and Gerard Gerdo. So that's the styles that made it to the top were Jiu-Jitsu and Savat. Savat yeah. And then this, I have written down, it's a beautiful jiu-jitsu from Hoist. Because, I mean, it's just what he does. He ends up taking him down, and then he submits him with a rear naked choke. I said, when I watched that, I went and got my wife, and I said, I want to say something on the podcast, but I don't know if it's going to come off as, like, cocky. So okay. I want you to watch this. And as I watch Hoist shoot on Gerard. 
the way that he shoots. He shot the same way on um, Boxer. Art Jimerson. He takes this huge front step. It's almost like his little teat kick. It's almost like the little flicker kick that he throws constantly mm-hmm. to keep you away from him. It looks like he tries to make it look like that, that he's going to try and kick you. But we all know that he doesn't really try and kick you. So he throws, a, he throws his leg out way in front of him and then steps and dives at your legs like this. And watching that maneuver and how telegraphed it is, I said to my wife, I feel like if I saw that in the first fight, if I had seen that fight and I trained, I could catch him with a knee. I could see him take that step and I could throw a knee in the, because it's so wide open. Like it's the worst, most telegraph takedown I've ever seen. When they're fresh, I mean, fresh is kind of fresh. Yeah, well, he's fresh when he fought. He was fresh when he fought the boxer that didn't touch him, Mm -hmm. you know? And when he fought Ken, so. Yeah. 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 So y'all heard it here, folks. If Ben Corn would have been there, <laughs> he would have gotten his arm. <laughs> he needs broken. Always. He would have gotten <laughs> choked. Yeah. Because the only thing I'm vaguely comfortable with is grappling. So like I wouldn't have had it in my mind. Oh, who knows what I would have had in my mind? Tapping. <laughs> yeah. Honestly. Like yeah. I'd be like, well, I'm glad that I'm fighting a jujitsu guy who's gonna get like where I can be like, oh, Choking me. Yeah, you're not going to suffer permanent brain damage yep. from this. Mm-hmm. I'd yeah. probably take it the way that Giroudeau did, without the biting. That's important to bring up. If you watch Gracie's like documentary, um, he talks about the reason that he kept choking Giroudeau at the end of it. Because Giroudeau taps, and then he's tapping, and he's tapping, and then the ref's like, hey. Yeah, that's nothing I was going to bring I'm going to gently like, caress you. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, that's because. Awful officiating. Yeah, it's awful. That's because early on he tries to choke him and Giroud has his chin down and he bites him. He bites Hoist. And Hoist says, like, I think that Hoist says to the ref, tries to tell him that he's biting him, or he's like, hey, man, there's no biting. And that Giroud just kind of like, and I mean, this is all from Hoist Gracie. So, one side of the story. Take here. it for what it's worth. But, like, you know, Giroud was just kind of like, hmm. And he was like, well, I'm going to get my arm under your chin now. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to put you and to sleep yep. for doing that. You know? Plus, there was a lot of, like, super high, angry testosterone just because Ken Shamrock was in the building. I, yeah. He was so mad. That's true. So mad. Yeah, he had a little post-fight interview after he beat, who was it? Pat Smith. Yeah, Pat Smith. Yeah. There was some kind of, like... And then Chest his, and then his and after, stuff going on. Yeah, and then after his Ken or after his uh Gracie fight, he does the um don't they tell him that he should be in movies? Is that here or is that on a future one? I think that's I on might a future have fast the that. Okay, well at some point he's fighting and that guy who's interviewing people, I should know who he is, but he um is like, You should think of a career in like movies, Ken. Yeah. What? <laughs> he may what have said that. Yeah. yeah. What are you doing? I man? just remember Ken gets up after the hoist fight after he like clearly tapped and there seemed like there was like a he, conversation he, about how like, he didn't tap. Uh it's Gracie says to him, he's like, You know that you tapped and uh Ken's mad at himself, but he's shaking his head yes. He's like, Yeah, I tapped. <laughs> I tapped. Yeah. He admits it. He He does admit it, but there is kind of like a weird like ten seconds there where there's like well, there's a weird... I don't know what was going here's on, Here's the thing that happened was it was going to be a Murillo Bustamante situation. Is that f- uh, fair me? That, no, 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 no. That's Paul Buntello. Okay. Murillo Bustamante. He looks like Don Flamenco from Punch-Out. It's a really mean thing to say. But um, no, uh, Murillo Bustamante was the, what, was the middleweight champion in the okay, UFC. Okay, yeah. And he fought Matt Linlin. The wrestler that I sent you that video of Chael telling the story about how Matt Lindlin had to make weight and yeah. Joe Warren throwing the scene that was point to he was able to get exactly on weight and if Joe Warren hadn't been standing there it wouldn't have happened. Mm. Yeah, that guy who won a gold like won a Olympic medal, uh, he fought Perillo Bustamante for the belt and he tapped to an arm bar 
and the ref did not see it. And Morello Bustamante felt the tap, and he let it go. And Matt Lindland was like, Joke's on you. I didn't tap. Yeah. And like there was a big, huge thing. And then he tapped him again. Oh, seriously? Yeah. Gotcha. Bustamante was a bad man. Like he's kind of that Frank Shamrock of like, who knows? He went to Pride instead of like, I mean, like you can see where the, you can watch Pride and know where the top end of it is. Mm -hmm. But like he never got like owned and he was nasty on the floor. Yeah. We need to. We need to eventually do a YouTube video on him, kind of like reviewing his career, yeah. like we're going to do with Frank. Mean Damien Maya. Like, okay. Like more aggressive. Like, oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Chest hair. <laughs> it's a sign of a good fighter. Yeah. yeah. So, do you have any closing comments on the final fight of the night? At UFC won. It went exactly scripted. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. And so then Hoist walks away with the 50 grand. One more story from this book that I wanted to tell you guys before, uh, it's another reason to read it from Art's book. He tells the story of, he called Ken Shamrock. He tried to get everybody, like he tried to recruit people and it goes through his recruiting process for all the fighters. And he contacted Ken Shamrock and Ken Shamrock was in Japan and he was doing shoot style pro wrestling, which sometimes is real and sometimes it's fake. Sometimes it's predetermined and sometimes it's not. That's a whole different story we'll have to get it's into. It's wild, eventually. yeah. And so he's talking to Art on the phone, and he's like, so the winner gets $50,000. And he's like, correct. And he's like, how legitimate is this? He's like, what do you mean? He's like, well, is it like, this is 100% like a real fight scenario. And he's like, yeah. And he's like, I'm there. <laughs> I will be there. That's what Mark Coleman said. Whenever he saw it, he saw it and he said, if this is real, I'm going to go make a lot of money. Because the only thing that he had seen was pro wrestling. And he's like, it's not real. I could kill all those people. And then he sees like early, early, early UFC. And sees like hoist headbutting people. Because they're headbutts that get used. That'll open up some submissions mm-hmm. right there. Hoist used it in all... Uh, Two fights for sure, maybe all three. Yeah, it's important. They're like the commentators say. Yeah, it's important. It changes the dynamic of things, especially when you got somebody like Mark Coleman in there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, um, so, yeah, that is UFC one. Good to times. Close the show. Yeah. Yeah, man. Close the show. Picks for BKFC six, which is coming up this weekend, and also the main event of UFC Fight Night: Moicano versus Korean Zombie. Starting off with BKFC6, Polly Malinaji, Artem Lobov. We already talked about one goat at the beginning of the episode in Chell's son, and now is the second one with Artem Lobov. I think that... How do you um, see that fight going down? Two ways. Polly wins definitively, or he breaks his hand and has to stop. Because he just shatters, his, he hits him too hard. Mm-hmm. And it's like, well, yeah. So it's pretty much Artem doesn't win. It's either like Polly wins or he loses on his terms. Yeah, that's okay. how I feel like it goes. I don't feel like there's any world in which like Polly just goes out there and gets overwhelmed by Artem Lobov. I don't feel like there's anybody who was like a champion boxer that's going to go over there and get overwhelmed by some T-Rex armed guy <laughs> that sticks his chin out. Yeah. It's not going to happen. Yeah. And as much as I love Artem, I mean, I feel like that's the case too. Like, I, I mean, Artem has a puncher's chance. That's what we're looking at. Artem has and a, even then, Artem I mean, has if you're dealing with the T Rex. chance. Artem has a, his too tough to die chance. Like, Artem has a, I saw that Jason Knight fight chance. That, like, that was honestly, yeah. that was a really good fight. Well, we talked about this. Good as in entertaining. Yeah. 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 And if it gets to that, that's how he beats Pauly. And because the round is, because the ring is round and because they don't have gloves on, it could I don't think it ever devolves to that. I think Polly quits. Polly isn't cut out for that. Yeah. You know? Polly is either gonna win, he's not gonna go into a war. He'll lose if that happens. Like he's not cut from the same cloth as Jason Knight and Artemar. Yeah, for sure. It's style above that toughness stuff because that's dumb their toughness is not it's detrimental to their self-preservation 
Mm. You know? Yeah, Polly's definitely on my list of, like, <laughs> characters that I don't like in the fight game. Because remember, I, I said a couple episodes ago that, like, I'm not very, like, polarized on fighters. Like, there's not a ton that I love and a ton that I hate. But there's a couple that, like, I just do not like. Yeah. So, Ali Abdulaziz is one, and Polly's up there. He's just one I I just do not like the guy. I, I hope and pray that Artem I, wins this fight. I couldn't – I can't hate him because of that confrontation where he slapped Artem and the things that he was yelling <laughs> at him and that Anthony Johnson – was standing there with his hand, like the just to, like I think it was just for him to show how big his hand is on Polly. Like his hand is on his ch- chest, just like the entire size of his chest holding Polly back. But he's just got a phone. Yeah, like, he's still filming, recording, yeah. filming Artem. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, bro, there could be dollies around. Let's not <laughs> let's not get yeah. this started gotta right be careful. here. Yeah, but um, so I official think, prediction for both of us, Polly. Yeah, I, I hate to say it, but sadly, I'm going to put my money on Polly because, I mean, putting all my bias aside. What's the line? I don't know. Let me look it up. Look that up. What do you think that it is? Because you, you don't know how Artem much. should be Artem should be plus 400. Seriously? You think it's going to yeah. be that much of a difference? It should be. I mean, what well, like what what record are you gonna base Artem on? Only bare knuckle, because he's like one and zero. Yeah, yeah. I wonder what the line was for the uh, Jason Knight fight with him. He should have won that fight. Kind of. Yeah, it, the line's not that big. It's negative two eighty for Polly plus two twenty for Artem. Put all of your money on Polly Maginani. Ben's calling it here, everybody. Yeah. All of your money. I mean, I hope that I hope that I'm wrong in a way because that'd be funny, you know. Yeah. The prediction according to Odd Shark is Polly Malinaji via decision. That's probably so. yeah. I don't see Polly finishing him other than, unless he like swells his both of his eyes shut. It's kind of a cowboy situation. Yeah. Where they just yeah. He's not gonna to like knock it, him yeah. unconscious because he can't hit him hard. He can't hit him as hard as it would be required. Because he'd break his hand. Mm-hmm. So, there All right. Go. And then for UFC, the main event is Hanato Moikano and the Korean Zombie are headlining UFC Fight Night. I think it's 154. I can't go Forgot against the zombie. Down. Can I go against the zombie? Because of what he did in that Dustin Poirier fight. Okay. I think we're going to disagree on this one because I think on the record I'm going to pick Moikano. Okay. He's coming off the Jose Auto loss. I think he's going to learn from that. I think he's going to solidify himself as a top five featherweight. Zombie's good. Zombie's man. got heart, though. It's going to be a good fight. Have you seen Definitely Poirier and Zombie? I haven't seen that fight. Woo, go watch that. That's such a good fight. That's my homework for this week. Watch Bloodsport and watch fight. Yeah, Zombie what's great Poirier. homework. Yeah, yeah. You <laughs> watch Bloodsport, then watch Zombie versus Poirier. There's a point in that fight where it's Kenny Florian on commentary and like they're they keep transitioning from like all like they're just rolling and rolling and it's grapple transition grapple transition striking people getting rocked them going to the floor almost getting tapped from repeated like triangles from the bottom and stuff and there's one where like zombie pops his head like no Poirier pops his head out of a triangle that is just like so tight and uh he sits up and it's like it's just gonna keep going. And Kenny Florian just says out loud, "He's like, oh my god!" <laughs> like it's just like, yeah, man, this is on a different level. Like yeah. these dudes are not gonna quit. And it was great. That was a great fight. Good. I hope this week's one is a lot like that. I hope I hope that Korean Zombie twisters him and <laughs> Dang. calls out the champ. Yeah, yeah, do it. Which, according to you, will Edgar. change after this month. Yeah. It's gonna be Edgar. <sighs> That's a bold pick. Call out Frankie. Now, are you so you're picking Edgar whenever we challenge him in May March? Yes. Okay. Edgar's gonna win that fight, bro. I will say this: I listened to some of their last episodes, and they're picking Tiago Santos to both upset Jones. Now, I don't know if they're gonna play it like that when they play us. If they're both gonna pick him, but on their podcast, they're picking Tiago Santos. So I'm sure that we're gonna get ahead there. Did you see? We're both picking John Jones, but yeah. Okay, this is MMA math. But did you see 
Um, Frankie Edgar versus Cub Swanson. I believe so. Both times. You see him finish him with 10 okay, seconds no, no. I'm left. thinking of a different fight. No, I haven't seen it. Yeah, okay. So Frankie completely dominates him and finishes him with like five seconds left in a 25-minute long fight. It's the, long, it's the latest submission of UFC history. They'd already whenever he face cranked him. Just a prolonged beating to show you who the man was. Mm-hmm. And then there was no reason to ever fight him again, but they did just because like Edgar fell down and Cub kind of went up. Yeah, because Ortega had knocked him out. So Yeah. So they fight again and Edgar wins again, right? Mm-hmm. Go watch Dustin Poirier versus Cub Swanson. There's a point where Cub mounts Poirier and literally gets like a Hulk Hogan like <laughs> to the crowd. <laughs> You know, yeah. like he just owns him. And I'm like, okay, fair enough. But like, I saw what Dustin Poirier versus Max Holloway was. And that was Dustin Poirier putting it on Holloway. Like hard, mm-hmm. you know? And I'm not saying that Frankie's going to put it on him that, that way. But yeah. like, I've, well, seen the, I've seen the progression and I'm like, look, man, I don't think he's going to get caught like he did against Brian Ortega. And that's I was about the to say because yeah. we'll, let's play with my math. There, we saw Ortega knock Hol- or we saw Ortega knock Edgar out, and then we saw Holloway dismantle Ortega. So are it's we like, allowed you know, to? But are we allowed to say? That's why I was talking about how he beat Cub. There's no question in anyone's mind that if they had that fight a thousand times, he's better than Cub Swanson. When you get in one punch knockout. When you get hit one time and you go to sleep, that doesn't necessarily mean that every time you fight that guy, you're going to get put out. I think that if Frankie Edgar fought Brian Ortega again, it, he would not get finished. Do you think that he would win, or do you think Ortega would, still wins? That's a tougher fight than Max Holloway is. Dang. For Frankie I'm just not Edgar. Not eye with you for Frankie Edgar, it's I think, a tougher fight. Yeah, not to get too into it, and we're about to close up. I feel like yeah. Max's reach is going to be way too much. I feel like he's probably just going to style on him. I feel like he's going to stuff the takedowns, and it's going to either be a finish or like a five round beating. But this is why it's great because you don't know until it happens. So it depends. And Frankie's tough, one of the best to ever do it. That's nothing against Frankie. That's just at the point in their careers. And how good Max is right now. I'll tell you the fight that I don't want to see for the health of Frankie is Frankie versus Poirier. Frankie goes to sleep against Poirier. He has no chance against Dustin Poirier. Yeah. That's my that just my instant like, wait a minute. Oh, that's the worst matchup. Because like as far as like why I think Max won't be able to get him is because I'm like, he's too fast. Like he'll be in and out and Max won't be able to jab him up quick enough. But, like, with what Poirier was able to do range finding against Max, as far as the stinging shots that were just coming in there, mm-hmm. I'm like, yeah, Max took those because of his, like, genetics, because he's an Islander. Yeah. <laughs> that, might be, that might be racist, <laughs> but, like, yeah, he's... I mean, it's in his favor, it, Well, so. yeah, it's a positive thing. It reminds me that there's an episode of uh, Tough Crowd with Colin Quinn back in the day. Where he was like, you want to fix test? You want to fix school system? You just need to bus in a bunch of Asian kids. And people started booing. And he's like, how is that an insult? <laughs> yeah. It's like, why is that bad? Like, I guess it's insulting to everyone else. But like, yeah, they got really high test scores. Yeah. But yeah. Um, you can't bet on during fights, though. Yeah, can't bet on an Asian during a fight. Unless it's a Korean zombie. Yeah, I did, didn't I? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right, man. I'll bet on undead Asians. You hope what? I'll I will bet on undead oh. Asians. Okay. Yeah. That's fair enough. Yeah. All right. You ready Absolutely. to close this one out? Absolutely, man. All right. Sounds good. Peace.